Many of Answers in Genesis's writers reject the idea that specialized knowledge about ancient Near Eastern context is, quote, required to determine biblical meaning, especially in passages like Genesis 1. I think they take this logic too far, inclining them to frequently impose their 21st century Western culture into the text. As evidence that specialized cultural knowledge is indeed often required to understand the Bible, I present here 10 examples of cases where I believe AIG has misinterpreted it. Number 1. Pterosaurs Young Earthers have often claimed that pterosaurs might be mentioned in the Bible. The CEO of the Creation Museum writes, there is mention of a flying serpent in the Bible, the fiery flying serpent of Isaiah 30 verse 6. This could be a reference to one of the pterodactyls, which are popularly thought of as flying dinosaurs, such as the Pteranodon Ramphorhynchus or Orthneocaris. Why is this wrong? An article in the Journal for the Study of the Old Testament by Philippe Provencal at the University of Copenhagen has shown that the flying serpents mentioned in Isaiah were actually an Egyptian allusion for the cobra. Because they venerated cobras, the Egyptians liked to exaggerate their hoods in art as actual wings, to symbolically communicate that these were divine beings associated with the gods. It turns out Isaiah's period saw a spike of Egyptian commerce into Judea in the archaeological record, and that's why we have dozens of Judean Hebrew inscribed seals depicting cobras in the winged Egyptian style. In fact, we have one such seal from one of Isaiah's own acquaintances who worked in the court of Ahaz. Isaiah's winged serpents are therefore an Egyptian locution for the cobra, not pterodactyls like the Creation Museum suggests. Number 2. Unicorns in the original KJV, there's an occasionally occurring animal that the translators rendered as a unicorn. Now virtually every modern translation understands this creature to be a wild ox, but AIG came up with a different theory. In keeping with their view that the earth is only 6,000 years old, they have a chapter in their answers book and several videos and articles on their website arguing that this may have actually been a Pleistocene genus of giant rhinoceros, reckoned by mainstream paleontologists to have gone extinct around 29,000 years ago. They drew this conclusion on the basis that they thought that this biblical creature called a Re'em in Hebrew probably only had a single horn. So what's the problem? Briefly put, it's the Sereyod plural construct grammar of Deuteronomy 33:17. That passage has the singular re'aim linked with the morphologically plural term for horns. A single horn interpretation is therefore grammatically impossible in that passage. It's therefore a wild ox. One of the first signs you see in the Creation Museum portico claims that Leviathan may have been some sort of ancient marine reptile like a plesiosaur. This identification has become a staple in young earth apologetics. The reasons why it's false are the following. First, in the 1920s, archaeologists discovered an ancient Syrian city named Ugarit, whose language was the closest to Biblical Hebrew that's ever been found. This civilization, predating the Biblical mentions of Leviathan, also had their own version of him called by the exact same titles and serving identical functions. He was a Semitic chaos god, a personification of the sea that the storm god Baal had to defeat in order to maintain the stability of the created order. Interestingly, the Ugaritic texts flat out say that this creature had seven heads. Which is significant because in Psalm 74, 14, where God is also defeating this dragon, the Hebrew grammatical construct unambiguously dictates that Leviathan has multiple heads. Multi-headed plesiosaurs are pretty sparse in the fossil record. Then there's the fact that Job point blank repeatedly says that this creature breathes fire. Unfamiliar with Leviathan's cultural literary background, young earthers proposing this view were forced to take this one at the chin, and they still teach that ancient marine reptiles must have literally been able to breathe flame. The other issue with the literal interpretation is the fact that the biblical authors themselves understood Leviathan as a mythic literary symbol. Psalm 74 says God destroyed Leviathan in the act of creating the world. If this is literally true, it would contradict Genesis 1, which never mentions such a battle. Also, it would contradict Isaiah 27, 1, which says that God will actually kill Leviathan on the last day in order to usher in the new heavens and new earth. See my Leviathan video for a fuller examination. Many young earthers also claim that the creature behemoth in Job was likely a dinosaur like Brachiosaurus. I've already created a video arguing that he was most likely a northwest Semitic chaos god, especially because he's used in dyad with the Semitic chaos god Leviathan. You see, when young earth creationists came up with this theory, they failed to catch what was going on with the bicola parallel verse structure of the poem, where it says behemoth extends his tail like a cedar. This word translated thighs is used in Aramaic literature of the testicles. The point of the term is that it was a polite designation for what exists between the thighs. This is why, for example, the Latin Vulgate translates it as testiculorum, or the King James translated it as stones. 
That word tail, therefore, is in parallel with the word testicles, implying that the author of Job is using the word tail as a euphemism for the male anatomy, in the same manner that we know post-Biblical Hebrew did. So Job is praising the reproductive virility of this creature, which corresponds nicely with the Ugaritic text. The Ugaritic version of Leviathan is paired with a monster called the Calf of God. For many scholars like John Day, former professor of Old Testament at Oxford University, or Neely Wazana at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, this has implied that Behemoth was most likely a massive, mythic bull symbolizing chaos. And that makes sense because the word Behemoth is an intensified form of a common Hebrew term for cattle, Behema. Number 5, the translation of Genesis 1. Young Earthers have traditionally understood the opening lines of Genesis to be what grammarians call an absolute temporal clause, that the phrase in the beginning encompasses the creation of the entire universe, of space-time itself. This is the logical basis Young Earthers like Jason Lyle cite for dating the entire cosmos at 6,000 years old, contrary to the 14.5 billion years espoused by the consensus of modern cosmology. However, some of the world's leading Hebraists have shown that there is now compelling grammatical and literary evidence that this interpretation is incorrect. First, Robert Holmstead at the University of Toronto wrote a doctoral thesis in which he discovered previously unrecognized grammatical rules governing Hebrew relative clauses. And these double marked Genesis 1-1 as a restrictive relative clause, falsifying the traditional absolute temporal translation. Second, as many Semitists have recognized, translating Genesis 1-1 as a relative clause as opposed to an absolute temporal clause astonishingly results in its cohering with the anomalous manner in which it was customary to open a creation account in Mesopotamia. It results in the syntax of Genesis 1 verses 1-3 through 3 following the pattern of a dependent clause, followed by an extended circumstantial clause, before arriving at the main verb. This rare cumbersome formula is how the Babylonian creation account the Akkadian Atrahasis, an Assyrian tablet called Kar 4, or most significant of all, the so-called second creation account starting in Genesis 2-4b, likewise open. Leading scholarship indicates that the syntax of Genesis 1 verses 1 through 3 doesn't permit us to know how long the matter of its chaotic state existed. Therefore, creationists are failing to recognize its restrictive clause syntax when they use it to rule out the possibility of an ancient universe. Number 6, the Hebrew Rakia. Genesis 1 verses 7 through 8 refers to the creation of a solid sky dome in Israel's creation account, called the Rakia, whose function was to retain a heavenly ocean that the Bible refers to as the waters above. This same concept is well attested in the art and text of Israel's neighbors. Its construction is particularly important in the Babylonian creation story. What do young earthers think the Rakia is? Larry Vardaman and Russell Humphreys have argued that the Rakia must be the quote, fabric of space and the waters above which it retains an expanding interstellar shell of ice particles some 20 million light years away. AIG Zone Answers Research Journal even deals with the waters above by literally consigning them to the edge of the universe. When Israelites gathered and sang, Praise Him, You Waters Above in Psalm 148, they weren't referring to ice particles at the edge of the space-time cosmos. The Old Testament authors simply believed in a solid firmament, just like all their ancient Near Eastern neighbors did. Job 37.18 Can you like him spread out the skies, hard as a cast metal mirror? When I first became literate in ancient Israelite cosmology, it pretty much horrified me as a Baptist. I get that this is a touchy subject for us evangelicals, so I'll be tackling the Rocky and the waters above, and why I don't think they're a problem for orthodox inspiration, in a lengthier video later. However, for now, here's a sampling of ancient Jewish and church father quotations illustrating that people before and during the early centuries of the church weren't deriving an atmospheric cosmology from the biblical texts. Number 7, The Seven Days of Genesis The Creation Museum is certainly correct that the days of Genesis 1 were intended as literal. In my opinion from the literature, Old Arthur attempts to interpret the seven days as intended references to millions of years are extremely unconvincing. That said, my grievance is that young and old Earthers have both usually missed the primary point behind the creation days. Namely, that the seven days were selected not to address the sort of chronologic astronomical concerns that occupy modern astrophysics, but because they were a convenient cultural symbol for the inauguration period of a temple. The construction of the tabernacle in Exodus 40 was completed in seven stages, and its priests ordained in a seven-day process. The construction of Solomon's temple took seven years, and it was dedicated during a seven-day festival held on the seventh month. And this temple symbolism wasn't unique to Israelite culture either. We have 4,000-year-old cylinders from Samaria, 
that also detail a seven-day temple dedication feast, or take the Ugaritic texts, written nearly a millennium before Genesis 1 was edited. They have Baal completing his house on cosmic Mount Zephanu, there's that mountain again, in seven days as well. It's not as if the Judaic exilic community in Babylonia would have needed their tears dried with the lesson in astronomic chronology. When God's temple was destroyed, it looked like the god Marduk had eaten Yahweh's lunch. The Judeans were quickly losing their religious identity under the territory of a foreign god, and they feared the Davidic prophecies their scriptures were refuted. They needed to know that Yahweh was still enthroned over the cosmos and had their backs. That's the sort of thing the cosmic temple theology of the seven days were chiefly intended to communicate. Number 8, The Ordering of the Seven Days I don't buy the framework hypothesis. I think the Princeton Hebraist Mark Smith blows it out of the water. But that said, leading scholars like Smith, William P. Brown, and David Toshio Samura have commonly pointed out that the creative acts in Genesis do incredibly happen to embody a mirrored structure. Given the absolutely staggering numerological and liturgical structures the author has woven into his narrative, see Jeff Morrow's paper, and the vast number of cogent other ways he could have ordered the account, some even more intuitive, this mirrored structure was very likely intentional. What am I saying? After all these years of debate, insecurity, and evangelicals feeling scientifically embattled over the strange ordering of the creation days, like the fact that Genesis 1 has the sun formed after trees, it's very likely that the whole show was largely a product of our failure to appreciate that the priestly author was just trying to be symmetrical. Number 9. The Lifespans of the Patriarchs Andrew Snelling, one of the geologists featured in the popular documentary Is Genesis History, uses the genealogies in Genesis to date the Flood roughly to 2300 BC. I'm no geologist, but I find it suspicious that the Flood managed to blast out the Grand Canyon in North America and fossilize the dinosaurs in Uzbekistan, but couldn't put a dent in the Sphinx at Giza constructed centuries earlier. That's a major problem with taking these numbers as historical quote to a precision of one year, as one AIG article words it. You end up having to join Bodhi Hodge in essentially jettisoning, for example, the chronology for all Egyptian civilization dated before 2300 BC. It's ludicrously untenable. The CEO of the Creation Museum has rebuked the senior editor at BioLogos for doubting the literalness of the lifespans of the patriarchs in Genesis. But I think Ham spoke too quickly here. Clearly, the lifespans of the patriarchs do involve mathematical contrivance and symbolism. The Bible itself is pretty blatant about this. In the genealogy in Genesis 5, for example, we are given 30 figures. They are all divisible by 5, or end in a 2 or a 7, with the single exception of Methuselah, whose age can be derived by adding multiples of 5 and 7. These sorts of statistics don't occur at random. That's not my theological opinion, it's math. The probability that Genesis 5 represents a natural genealogy has been calculated at 0.0000006%. Moreover, subtract 7 from any of the numbers not already divisible by 5, and they become divisible by 5. Isn't that a strange coincidence? What do I mean by the lifespan figures containing symbolism? I'm saving those for the future as well because there's so much to go through. But here's two textbook examples. Enoch, who famously walked with God, is, surprise, the seventh from Adam, and his lifespan was 365 years, the same number of days in the solar calendar, which has Mesopotamian significance. Or take Lemech, the seventh in Genesis 4. He died at 777 years. Genesis 4 also says he would be avenged seven times, and it's probably not a coincidence that he's the seventh from Enosh, whose name is equivalent to the etymology of Adam. I'll link to a peer-reviewed journal article discussing the numerology of these figures further for those interested. Number 10, Animal Death Before the Fall. Based on centuries of church tradition, most Christians believe the Bible teaches the original creation was free of animal predation. However, a doctoral dissertation by the Hebraist Joshua Van E. conducted under a committee of archaeologists and ancient Near Eastern specialists at the University of California has demonstrated that ancient Israelite religion held no concept of an original state of animal peace. That doctrine seems to have been a post-Hellenistic construction, certainly not a West Semitic or Mesopotamian one. Take the creation mandate for humanity to subdue and rule the animals in Genesis 1. It actually uses military terminology. As the Old Testament scholar Daniel Stulak comments, theologians are guilty of, quote, persistent underreporting the violence implied by the text's key terms. It is clear from context that these terms are not benign. This first verb translated subdue occurs 13 other times in the Bible. Comprehensively, in six of these cases, it's used of war conquest of hostile lands. 
Five other instances used it of forcing people into slavery. Among the remaining two, Micah 719 uses it as a reference to trampling underfoot, and Esther 78 uses it for assault. It turns out the cognate for this term in Akkadian is equally harsh. In the case of the command to rule here, the Berkeley Hebraist Robert Alter likewise acknowledges in his notes, quote, In most of the context in which the term occurs, it seems to suggest absolute or even fierce exercise of mastery. A comprehensive survey confirms this. So Genesis 1 speaks of nature originally as a foe to be conquered, with terms similar to Israel's command to militarily take dominion over Canaan. This implies an original situation of hostility between humanity and the animal world. And it's not like the curse in Genesis 3 says anything whatsoever about Adam's sin catalyzing the origins of animal predation or death. But Genesis 1 certainly isn't the only text that young earth creationists are taking their original vegetarian reading from, so you'll have to check out my longer video on animal death for the fuller argument. So those were a few examples of why I disagree with answers in Genesis when some of its writers claim that specialized cultural linguistic knowledge isn't necessary to determine biblical meaning. It frequently is. I think we're also justified in being skeptical of young earth organizations, not merely because they draw extremely minority scientific conclusions, but because these conclusions are frequently predicated on falsified interpretations of this ancient Semitic religious corpus we call the Old Testament.